This week in the Enterprise Security News, uh, new Cisco and App Dynamics integration bridges IT and DevOps for better app management. Citrix and FireEye, Mandiant launch an indicator of compromise scanner. Sophos introduces Intercept X for mobile, optimizing your IT spend as you move to the cloud, and more. In our second segment, we'll deliver a technical segment on migrating legacy apps to the cloud, part one, kind of a preview of some of the stuff I will be discussing on Container Security Day at InfoSec World. In our final segment, we welcome Stephen Bay, Director of Security Operations at Security On Demand, to discuss Edward Snowden and the insider threat. So stay tuned for all that and more on this episode of Enterprise Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly, for security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where we talk security vendors and aren't afraid to name names. It's Enterprise Security Weekly. The Viavi Solutions Observer Platform provides SecOps teams a powerful combination of comprehensive data for threat hunting and incident response that includes wire data analytics and enriched flow records. Using pure, unaltered packet and net flow, Observer presents views across the entire IT infrastructure with threat alert features including scope, impact, and advanced traffic profiling. Teams can use automated workflows to dive into high-fidelity network evidence and more quickly resolve issues, minimizing impact on customers, users, and business operations. Learn more about the Viavi Network Security Solution and download free resources at securityweekly.com forward slash Viavi. That's V-I-A-V-I. The question is simple. Have any of the systems on my network been compromised? The answer is harder than it should be. Enter AI Hunter. Active Countermeasures has automated and streamlined techniques used by the best pen testers and threat hunters in the industry to create AI Hunter, a network threat hunting solution that does the first pass of a hunt for you to identify systems that are most likely to be compromised and scores the results on a scale from 0 to 100. You can then research those systems in depth with AI Hunter. Focus your valuable time on the systems that need your expertise with AI Hunter. Sign up for a personal demo today at securityweekly.com forward slash ACM. Welcome to episode 170 of Enterprise Security Weekly for January 29th, 2020. I'm, of course, your host, Paul Asadorian, joined by Mr. Matt Alderman here in studio. Welcome, Matt. Six weeks and counting. Oh, it was way too long to be away from studio. Right. Yeah, <laughs> nice to have you uh, back here in studio. Uh, join us at InfoSec World, a little preview of that on this show, March 30th through April 1st at the Disney Contemporary Resort. Security Weekly listeners will receive uh, save 15% off the InfoSec World Main Conference or World Pass. You can visit securityweekly.com forward slash ISW2020. Click the register button to register with our discount code or to schedule a sponsor micro interview, which we'll be doing at the, uh, that show as well as RSA and Black Hat. So if you want to get your message out there uh, as to what problem you solve and how you solve it and why you do it better than anyone else, an interview with our staff, myself included, uh, should be on your schedule, actually. Yes, it should be. It should be. <laughs> it should be. It's a great way to do it. Come on over and hang out with us and do an interview. That's it. That's it. All righty. Uh, we're on to the news for this week, Matt. There were a lot of, uh, actually, news announcements. Yeah, you thought it might be a little slow before yeah, RSA conference because we're, what, three weeks away or so. It's like everyone said, no, nah, forget it. We're going to just do it now. Yeah, we're doing well, it now. Maybe we're in the pre-announcement <laughs> stage because a lot of companies do that. Yeah. They wait until a couple of weeks like before. Like the week before or yeah. two weeks before. It's funny because years ago when I was at RSA, you in even at Qualys, right, everybody would – that. That week of, everybody on Monday yeah. made all their announcements. And then it got so busy, people you started going to the week before. Right. <laughs> well, I think it's starting to happen now is people are like, yeah, we're just going to do it whenever. Because right. there's so much news that comes out of RSA conference, it mm -hmm. can get lost. And we're there, so we don't, we may cover parts of it, but we don't get a chance to cover it until after the after. conference. Right. For us. Right. Yeah. That's why you should do an interview. Get right, extra promotion. Because then you'll get that extra promotion. You'll be able to highlight what you're releasing at RSA conference and be able to amplify that at the conference and also get some additional traction as part of our recap show. Um, so Cisco and App Dynamics bridging uh, IT and DevOps for so app it, management. I, I mean, I've a lot been, going on. Here. Yeah, but it, it, what's interesting to me about this is 
I knew this is where part of the application market was going to go. Mm -hmm. Application performance and application security, bringing the two components together. When they made the App Dynamics acquisition, they didn't do much with it at first. Mm -hmm. Now what you're starting to see is is bringing uh, the stuff closer together, um, which I think is a good thing. Because if you think about the data you're collecting about an application, not only from a performance perspective, it also is data you need from a security perspective. So mm -hmm. why have two tools, two agents running in your application if you can start to bring all that stuff together? Uh, and look at both use cases um, together. So, you know, it, it, they're starting to make some moves with the acquisition, which I thought was good. Um, yeah, this seems more uh, DevOps and I, less security yeah. and more DevOps and IT. Like uh, the experience journey maps displays the most important user experience journeys within mission critical apps. Yeah. That sounds like something that a commercial uh, vendor, like not in security, right? Like mm -hmm. I make. Uh, you know, I'm Amazon or whatever, and I need to look at how people are using the application and make tuning and changes. What's happening is you're seeing a lot of security vendors really moving their solutions into the developer's hands, mm -hmm. right? They're trying to figure out how to capture the developer audience early as part of that CI CD pipeline, right. and then providing the security folks um, visibility into what's going on with these applications. It's a huge blind spot for most security teams, but people realize some of the security teams aren't ready to address application security at this level yet. So mm -hmm. they're they're trying to sell right into the developers. This is another example of that. And then you start to bring these capabilities forward. Sweet. Sequence security. I feel like we've done stuff with sequence before. We, we have. have. We've done a briefing. We've done, I think, one or two briefings with sequence in the past. Bot management, bot defense. Uh, there are SaaS platforms available in AWS. Um, you know, what's, what's interesting about, um, it's not, to me, it's not just about the bot uh, announcement. It's SaaS and oh, AWS yeah. Marketplace is actually yeah. pretty interesting, now right? Now it comes back to me, sequences is, is bot yeah. defense. Yeah, bot defense. Bot defense. Right. Um, but setting up any system can be a challenge, as you will talk about mm -hmm. in our technical segment, uh, about... How do you get an application up and running? So, yeah, I've got all these applications in the marketplace, but now i got to set it up and get, grab an EC2 instance, and which instance do I grab? Mm -hmm. And so now what you're seeing people start to do in the uh, marketplace is make it easy to um, get enrolled into a SaaS application. Uh, Amazon's done some really interesting things to allow you to meter um, usage. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so it makes it really easy for vendors sometimes to get their customers onboarded and provide this really interesting, easy, integrated billing system that is more integrated into the marketplace. And I think you're going to see more people start to build more metered applications mm -hmm. because of all the challenges of setting these things up as EC2 <laughs> instances with a bring-your-own-license model. Right. Yeah. And I, I, I think these services will, will work well when I look at the marketplace and kind of like pre-configured apps that you can get what you know like kind of first thing kind of a preview into the uh, next segment or whenever we're doing that segment um is w when it's a service that you don't need a whole lot of visibility and control into the underpinnings of how it's working mm -hmm. this is uh, a security product that helps you you know defend against and have uh, telemetry on bots right yeah. You don't necessarily need to be in the weeds of the Docker configure on the operating system, right? <laughs> this is an app that I can just add on. And there's use cases for that. I think some of the trouble is when you look in the marketplace, there are apps in there that I, I tried and did not like because it didn't give me enough of that or it made it even more difficult to heavily customize them, right? Mm -hmm. So if you want to go in there and like use LightSail for WordPress, it probably, I mean, in the test environment, yeah, but like in production, you're like, no, I really need a specific config for this, yeah. right? Um, and, and even, you know, just like Apache and Nginx, a lot of the open source uh, stuff is available uh, in things like LightSail and as uh, in the marketplace. I don't recommend you use those. But if I'm going to take a security tool and integrate that into my AWS uh, applications, wherever they are, right. I think that's a much better use case, and certainly for bot defense, right? Because right. you wanna, want to get access to my VPC and then configure the app and just like yeah. 
be done, right? Well, I because I think bot traffic makes up something like a third to yeah. half of the internet traffic mm -hmm. uh, on the internet, right? And so these solutions sitting in front of your applications actually helps them perform better. Uh, and, and having this integration into AWS and making it really easy to deploy, I think yeah. is the big thing, right? Mm -hmm. It's time to value in these solutions. Yeah, it's great that I have something in the marketplace and then I need bring me your own license and then I got to spin up an EC2 instance, right. install it's, it and configure yeah, it and yeah, yeah, all yeah. that. Your time to value just goes out the window right. because all the testing you've been doing, you realize... It's not that easy. Well, which which instance do I need? Do I need memory optimized, CPU optimized? <laughs> There's yeah. too many choices. Well, but then it's all the other configuration in AWS that slows yeah. you down. I mean, segueing from the article, and I won't talk so much about this. And the, the next time would be kind of like a foreground, uh, more like getting started. Um, but when you get into AWS it, and you start to configure things, you're like, wait, now I got to think about my IAM roles, my security groups my availability zones, my subnets, my how I do DNS and IP, whether I want elastic IPs or how that's configured, right? And what what happens oftentimes with me is I, I put the cart before the horse, right? And I go and I start configuring something like, wait, I need to back up and define my base kind of strategy for AWS um, and think about how I create all those roles uh, in other configuration in AWS before I can go in and start deploying applications yes. that's what i've kind of discovered so i'm trying to move a little too fast <laughs> for my own good <laughs> basically <laughs> um and it's tempting because like i said you can jump right in and go into right something like a light sale or elastic beanstalk right that's d d don't don't bother with that right now i those are really more for just spinning something up quick to test it uh maybe use them for your lab kind of thing mm -hmm. or or whatever uh, they're, in my opinion, not really meant to really have customized applications. No. And, and those are in two different categories, right? There's ones you write yourself, uh, we have the source code, and then there's open source and or commercial right. applications that, that you're just running, want to deploy. Yeah, right. Do you want to hit the other Cisco article? Because there were two for Cisco. Yeah, IoT security uh, architecture. Uh, yeah, IoT, IoT and, and OT. OT. So, We've seen a lot of movement in operational technology. Everybody talks about IoT. Um, OT is an interesting one for me uh, just because of my background in critical infrastructure. Um, but you're seeing a lot of movement on the OT side, right? People trying to bridge this gap of traditional IT security and OT, now IoT. Uh, and Cisco is, is launching um, some security architectures to help get more visibility into those environments. They're in a really interesting spot at Cisco because they're on the network, mm -hmm. right? And so when you think about what a lot of vendors have done that are specific in the OT space, they're doing a lot of passive analysis of network traffic. Mm -hmm. well, who better to be able to do passive traffic analysis right. on the network Cisco. than Cisco themselves? Yeah. They own most of the devices in the network. So I think it's a really interesting announcement. Well, and they also developed many of the protocols uh, that right. use for that. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think the big challenge with uh, operational technology as a whole and IoT is understanding all those protocols. This is a protocol detection game first mm -hmm. to understand what traffic looks well, like. Even the, the switching protocols that allow you to mirror traffic mm -hmm. and or right. manage your switches and things yeah. like that. But then you add on... Then, uh, then there's the OT right, protocols. Then all the OT yeah. protocols that go on top of that that have to be analyzed to understand... What does that traffic normally look like? Because a lot of these solutions are looking for, they're trying to normalize what traffic looks like and mm -hmm. looking for abnormal stuff going on in those traffic patterns. Um, that's a lot of work that has to be done. You got a networking company that understands how to do this stuff. Bringing some of this stuff, I think, makes sense. Well, and then I, how do others use it or how will Cisco use it in some of their other solutions? But I, I think we're seeing a trend, not just in the security marketplace, because we talked about Waterfall uh, getting some funding, right? Or getting some funding. And what we see on the attacker side is more and more are, we're uncovering attacks against critical infrastructure. Yes. I mean, we've always had that, right? There's always been attacks against critical infrastructure. But in my opinion, you know, having tracked the, the security news for quite some time, uh, I, we, we're seeing a lot more of it. And I think we're seeing the kind of uh, reaction to that in the market yep. where we see announcements like this. Well, Tri a couple Tripwire had some, some posts this Tripwire's week. Tripwire's done some stuff. Yep. Um, 
you know, Tenable made the Indigy acquisition. Yeah. Forescout made the Security Matters uh, acquisition last year. So you're seeing some acquisitions in this space where traditional security companies are now crossing over into this OT, IOT space. Um, so I think we're going to yep. see a lot more movement here. I agree. And it also depends on your perspective. Those of that have been doing research into critical infrastructure yeah. uh, in ICS have obviously been in the thick of things for some time. Um, and, but I, I think if you're outside looking in, you look at the political, uh, geopolitical climate oh, yeah. and all that stuff, right? And it's, it's way more prevalent. Yes. Probably Absolutely. has been for some time. It has been. We don't see it hit the, the news <laughs> for some time, right? Also, I'm reading, um, the latest book I'm reading is called Sandworm by Andy Greenberg. And it's about the Russian attacks on the Ukraine uh, power infrastructure oh, right. and the malware and mm -hmm. all of the players involved in that. Yep. Uh, I highly recommend that book, by the way, especially if you're just getting started in security or recommend it to those who want to get into the field because they really do kind of back up and really explain, like they explain the meaning of the acronym ICS and SCADA, oh, right? Which for us, it's like, yes, yeah, yes, we know that, but they're trying to target the book at a larger audience, which makes it very applicable for those getting into the into the field. Yeah, because we, 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 we take a lot of stuff for granted. We throw, we throw around a lot of TLAs. Yeah. <laughs> Three letter acronyms for all those listening at home. Yes. <laughs> uh, where else do we want to go? Um, swim lane had an announcement. Yeah. And, uh, see, I, I, I like swim lane because they have not been acquired yet. <laughs> That's <laughs> basically what it boils down to. Uh, I don't know. I just, I have, uh, when you're in a space such as SOAR, right, that's seen a lot of acquisitions. A lot. And we've seen that for some time. Uh, you know, very vividly, I remember Command, and they were like a seed round startup. Mm -hmm. uh, fantastic team. And I mean, they're kicking butt now at Rapid7. Rapid7 bought them very fast. Fast. Very early. early. On. Yes. Uh, and we saw a lot of other uh, Phantom. Phantom. Uh, 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 FireEye bought one. He Hexa, Hexadite or something, something like that. Like yeah, that. something like I think that. It was. Well, that was, was that Microsoft that bought Hexa something? Yeah, somebody. Yeah, yeah. There were a number of acquisitions in this space, right? We see the I mean, players. They're on yeah. version 10, uh, reducing mean time to detect and response for security incidents, which, I mean, if you're going to position yourself in the market, not a bad place to start in terms of a title to, to draw people in. Mean time to detect and mean time to respond are two of the biggest challenges with insider yep. threats and or, or these um, lateral movement attacks, et cetera, the sooner you can find them and respond to them, the less damage they cause. This has been you know, one of those big open issues for a long time in the space. That's where the SOAR vendors can do some really interesting things, um, which is why you've also seen a lot of acquisition by the SIM vendors adding this capability um, to improve their detection response uh, capabilities in the SOC. Say improved high avail availability architecture supporting Kubernetes and Docker. Yeah, it's awesome. More, more, yeah, more stuff to, to monitor in in this uh, new application world. Yeah, because you got to monitor your monitoring tools. Yes, that's important. Um, what else? Oh, I thought this was interesting. The indicator of compromised scanner. Yeah, I have not checked this out, but I thought that was it's a free tool to allow customers to run locally against their six Citrix instances and receive a rapid assessment of potential indications of compromise on their systems. Yeah, it's looking, exactly for a very sure it's looking for a very specific attack on Citrix, and they worked with FireEye to create the scanner. Oh, this is just in response to, uh, well, yeah, they say CVE 2019-19781, yep. which is a really bad attack. Yes. Okay, we cover that on Paul Security Weekly. Yeah, but it's interesting you, you, um, when you think about partnering for a scanner of a CVE, you would think right. one of the vulnerability management vendors. You don't think FireEye, right? Right. Um, so it was just interesting, you know, that they're building this this um, this joint kind of scanner to to look for this kind of stuff. I would have gone to, you know, one of the VM vendors and said, mm. "Hey, you know, what do you have? How do we how do we, you know, do this together?" But they went to FireEye um, to do it. There's another um, uh, free tool, too. Uh, who was it? Recorded? Who did it? Was it oh, Sophos. Oh, no, no, no. It's not Sophos. There's another one in here, another free scanner that got released uh, for the malware for the federal government. Who the heck? Oh, uh, Cyber Reason. Yes. Oh, Cyber Reason. I knew it was one of the endpoint guys. I couldn't Sorry, remember who yeah, it was. I didn't, I didn't clean up the titles as 
much as I should have. <laughs> so it was kind of a mess in there. Well, you've got I've got like 15 articles on yeah. in front of me. It's like which one's which? Oh, for Emotet malware. Yeah. Uh, for mostly state uh, and local governments is what I kind of gleaned from the article. Yeah, but it's a it's a free uh, tool to help look for this malware in the environment. And I don't know why it's just maybe because the target has been more of these local and state governments as part of ransomware attacks. But my assumption is anybody could use this tool to look for it. I don't think it's just limited to Correct. state and local governments. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, which Emotet's got you know, a lot of attention. Uh, not recently, but, you know, in the past year or so or whatever. We should probably do a segment on it. It's probably pretty interesting once you uncover Yeah, and it's an old piece of malware. It I didn't is. realize it's it was around. It's, it's been, been around, around since 2014. I was like, yeah. wow, and here it is, 2020. It's six years, and we're still talking about uh, this variation of, of malware that's out there. Uh, what else we got? Stack Rocks uh, supports Google Anthos. Yeah, the interesting part of this <laughs> announcement to me is just Anthos in general, right? Um, what is Anthos? Uh, it, it's the their um, it's their platform for hybrid environments. Mm-hmm. Um, what was what was Amazon's? Was it Greenhopper or was that somebody else? Anyways, um, it's a platform that allows you to take your applications and run them on premise, in the cloud, or a combination of both. Yep. So. Antho, what you're seeing all the cloud providers do is provide an architecture where you can run parts of the architecture on premise uh -huh. and in the cloud so that as you're developing and deciding where to run pieces, you have consistency across the stack. Azure's doing the same thing mm -hmm. with Maz, um, mm -hmm. their, their version of, of an on prem solution. And so. That's what Anthos is, and you're seeing all the vendors that have been going after Kubernetes really starting to support Anthos natively because one of the things that gets bundled into Anthos is Kubernetes, mm -hmm. where you can run it on-prem or in the cloud. So everybody's going to add support for Anthos, that anybody that's going after that Kubernetes layer. And there's a number of current companies and startups all coming after Kubernetes security because where we see mm -hmm. container and orchestration and Kubernetes kind of being the de facto, everybody's trying to figure out how to secure that environment. And so all these vendors will eventually have some, if, if you're running your solutions in GCP mm -hmm. and you're managing, you're looking at Kubernetes, you're going to be supporting Anthos. Gotcha. And that doesn't require hard, like their hardware on site because Amazon had a service and it required... An I, Amazon piece of hardware yeah, on, I, on site. I, I think that's a different, yeah, there's I, so many different cloud services. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm looking at the, I know what the components are, right? So it, it, it's a GKE uh, for Kubernetes, some configuration service mesh stuff um, using Istio. Um, I don't know that it requires specific, their specific hardware. I think it's more of a framework that mm -hmm. you can run on your hardware or in the cloud, but it gives you consistency across. No matter no matter where you're deploying applications, you have that consistency I gotcha. between on-prem and GCP. Well, and because the other problem we have with this too is where do you do development and testing, mm -hmm. right? If you do it all in the cloud, it can be really expensive. Yes, absolutely. And then if you do some of it locally, however you want to slice it and dice it, uh, n now you're supporting multiple configurations. Correct. Which is difficult. And potentially multiple deployment models to push it to the different places. Correct. This is trying to uh, bridge that gap and make it really easy so it's consistent across no matter where the deployment location yeah, is. Yeah, that's really nice because uh, some of the things that I've been working on, I deploy it locally to do development and testing. And then you've got a completely different you know, setup and deployment to get it into production. Mm hmm and they're adding some of the other, um, they're adding stack driver in here, so monitoring management of the different services and applications, so you have that consistency across. So now you can write a common set of tools yeah. uh, to monitor your applications in your environment that are available in GCP. You can now leverage those on-prem. That's what this is. Uh, that, Anthos was the interesting part. I mean, StackRox is, you know, originally in the container security space, but really started to focus on Kubernetes and the Kubernetes layer. Mm -hmm. And now you're seeing some new startups come out really focused on the Kubernetes layer uh, because everybody's trying to figure out how to, how to capture the Kubernetes market share. Oh, this Flexera blog post, uh, 
It's a good place to go next. Optimizing your IT spend as you move to the cloud. This is still cha- very challenging. Oh, yeah. Well, you, 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 we were just talking about it right before the show. It's like, which EC2 instance do I need? Yeah, don't pick the wrong one because that one costs a lot of money. <laughs> well, and then there's that. And then like you can lose track of very oh, easily, yeah. especially as you start looking at um, Terraform and things like that where you can automatically spin up infrastructure. Yep. And then the thing that gets you in, a couple of things that get you in AWS, and I'm sure it's similar in other cloud providers, are one, the region that you're in, right? Mm-hmm. So like AWS, if you're in the interface, when you change your region, you, you like your display can either show you a lot of stuff because I'm in the region where I spun up a lot of stuff. Yep. Then I go to a different region. I'm like, oh, no, I didn't actually spin up that infrastructure, but it's because I'm in a different region, uh, which really, really sucks. Because then it, you get your bill and you're like, Oh, I just forgot to like spin down this entire cluster because it was in this other region. Now there's lots of management tools right. above and beyond the yeah. interface, and the mileage is going to vary with the the web interfaces on a lot of these tools. They may command line tools. Then there's commercial <laughs> and open source, or you know, yeah. for to manage all of that. But one of the things that happens when you think about uh, different regions is you get charged for some of that, you get that cross traffic. Cross traffic. Right. Uh, and, and traffic can kill you yeah. in AWS. You know, everybody's like, well, yeah, data in is free. Yeah, but data out is where, where you get dinged. And so when you're, when you're sending across regions, you're mm-hmm. going to get charges for that bandwidth. And so you really have to think about your architectures, back to the earlier conversation, <laughs> where <laughs> we, you really want to architect this to really look at your, cost structures too you may want to be multi-region but you if you do that you want to minimize cross-region traffic because there's a cost impact and and partially a performance impact as well but you have to know all that stuff going in as you architect these applications because you can rack up bills really really well, fast because in a lot of cases it just happens automatically <laughs> yeah. right uh, yeah and by I, the developers by the way they're like yeah, we're just going to spin up one of these right. and one of those and a couple of these, and next thing you know, you've you've got There's all this that, infrastructure uh, just running. Just reading about say that, like rotating uh, deployment, right? Because you can spin it up and down in different regions, mm-hmm. and it does the uh, rotating deployment. Yeah. But what that means, you've got to realize where you left off. If your app spins up in a different region from where your RDS instance is, like Matt, you were saying, you're going to rack up a, a huge a huge bill. Yep. For network traffic cross cross zones. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. Absolutely. Yeah, so this gives you some good tips and tricks uh, on how to um, monitor and, and manage and automate some of that. What else was in here? We talked about that one. Cloud Knox. Cloud Knox, yeah, raises $12 million. This is, a, I think, a B round. Uh, they're $22.75 million in, so I think it's a B round. It didn't say specifically. Uh, so a couple interesting things about this. We're going to see a lot more movement on the identity space. Mm-hmm. It's one of my th- my th- my three mm-hmm. um, pillars of the future, right? App, user, data, uh, and I we're starting to see a lot more movement in the identity space. Uh, Clear Skies in here, you know, and Clear Skies has done a lot of uh, investment in security companies. Art Coviello is associated with this company mm-hmm. as a strategic advisor from his days at RSA. Uh, so they're making some movement here. Um, but we're going to see a lot of, of uh, activity in the identity space. This is really focused on hybrid and multi-cloud environments and managing. Uh, it looks more privilege management across these environments, Paul, because um, a lot of their website talks about overprivilege and, and privilege access. Uh, so they're going to be competing with the cyber arcs and, and some of those privilege access management systems, but trying to provide kind of uh, a fabric for both hybrid and cloud and into the multi-cloud environment of managing uh, identity and, and privilege access, it looks like. Uh, Sophos introduces Intercept X for mobile. They talk about Fleeceware, which is interesting, which is um, apps that uh, fail to unsubscribe and just keep charging users mm-hmm. uh, for things. And um, they say they persist in the Play Store um, but they also say that the they're introducing new security capabilities for Chrome OS devices, which I I think are going to be more popular in the enterprise. Yeah, that's just my prediction. Of, just get rid of the operating system. And well, get rid of Windows as your operating right. system, but you're just trading that for Chrome OS. And I don't think we've seen a whole lot of research come out for Chrome OS. Interesting. 
Like, I'm anticipating a black hat talk on someone just cracking Chrome OS <laughs> wide open. <laughs> That's my prediction. <laughs> will it we'll be this see. year, next year? When will it be? I, I think this year, but I don't know. I could be wrong. But so that's interesting. Because that we move more stuff to just browser-based applications. Yeah. What do you need a full operating system right. for anymore? I mean, some of our employees use Chromebooks because mm -hmm. all they're doing is going into Gmail and HubSpot and, and other browser-based applications. applications right? right. Yeah. So it remains to be seen what that, uh, those vulnerabilities will look like. Yes. Uh, most AV vendors, talking Sophos and segueing in, will continue to support their products under Windows 7, even though it's end of life. I don't know. I, like, I debate whether this is a good thing or I, a bad I don't thing. Think it, right? I, I don't think it's a good thing, right? <laughs> All we're doing is we're giving people a crutch to stay yes. on an out-of-date operating system. Why? why? Mm -hmm. I, I, just, I, th I don't understand this one because we know, unless you're on extended support, um, you're not going to get updates from the OS manufacturer. So why are the AV vendors going to continue to support that operating system? It's kind of weird to me. It just creates a risk profile from a threat landscape that I, I don't know that encouraging that is a good idea. I mean, on the flip side of that, you can't just snap your fingers and get rid of all Windows 7 either. I, look, I understand, but how long have people known this was going to happen? You're this right. happens to every single operating system that's ever been pushed out there. It has an end-of-life structure to it, and you know well in advance when it's coming. Now, I get it. Some organizations who are using variations of Windows 7 in certain environments have a difficult time um, migrating and, and doing that in, a, in an effective time frame, but holy cow. But I also think, you know, from an AV vendor perspective, I, it, it could be maybe a good thing or a bad thing. So it, you're selling them a product that might only live on those Windows 7 systems for another year, right, right until they migrate off of them. Right. It's or you could look at it as people that have Windows 7 are going to be hot to trot to buy uh, protection that's going to support mm -hmm. Windows 7, which may cause them to, you know, leave that operating system mm -hmm. around uh, even longer. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, it's, I think it's kind of interesting uh, of course, I think the answer is to get to Windows 10. I mean, there's obviously some great security benefits there that we've talked about. Oh, of course. Uh, and we'll continue to yes. talk about. But It's a stopgap, but you don't want this to be a crutch for people to keep Windows 7 around. Run I mean, longer. we had this problem yeah. with IE and old versions of yeah. Internet Explorer. And, uh. Uh, Magnet Forensics unveils a new solution that simplifies remote forensics investigations. I thought it was pretty cool. Also, I mean, you've got to balance when you do these forensic investigations mm -hmm. too, right? Yeah. Because uh, I forget we were talking about it with someone. Uh, that you don't want to do a full-blown forensics investigation for every single strain of malware that you find because you're going to spend all your time doing forensics and not, you know, maybe miss something else. Right. So, uh, you know, kind of going back to the, the sore thing with swim lane, right? Be able to have... Uh, really good intelligence that tells you, look, based on all this, this malware is one that you should do forensics on. Right. And then having a tool that lets you grab that stuff remotely. Uh, I remember way back in the day, Tenable had a feature that lets you yeah. actually grab it uh, to grab from it. memory. Yeah. Which is awesome. This is great. I mean, the added support here helps in forensics investigations. Uh, it allows you to pull in. Um, uh, it looks primarily for... O365 G Suite box and some of the stuff up in AWS uh, gives them the ability to pull forensic state out of there for evidence. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, awesome. Well, that will conclude the news for the show. Stay tuned. Uh, tech segment coming up next.